Okay, so now I'm even more glad than a minute ago to have Maddie Weinstein here uh, and Jill tell us about algebraic geometry of curvature and matrices with partition eigenvalues. Okay, thank you, Robbie. Yeah, as Robbie said, I will not bite your head off. I'm going to outsource all of the biting to that little guy over there. There's pumpkin pie. <laughs> so feel free to ask me questions. Um, don't disturb his nap, though. So, okay, so the title of this talk is Algebraic Geometry of Curvature and Matrices with Partitioned Eigenvalues, which seems a little joint, a disjoint. I'd say the structure of this talk is somewhat autobiographical. So I'll just go through saying, you know, I had this question and it led to this question and this question, um, you know, and part of my goal for this talk is to push a philosophy on you as much as it is to present specific ideas. Okay, so we'll start by motivating the topic um, with this quantity called the reach of an algebraic variety. So I want you to start with this blue um, curve. I guess my first proselytizing will be like, most people say this is a tooth, but I'm gonna call it a butterfly, which is, I think, you know, a friendlier name for curves. So we have this blue butterfly curve and we're gonna take some point off of the curve and we're gonna ask what's my nearest point on the blue curve. And if I'm very nearby this blue butterfly curve, um, there's one nearest point. Okay, but let's say I get a little bit farther away. If I get here, for example, then I have two nearest points on the curve. If I get here, I could even have three um, nearest points on the curve. So, uh, so this faint blue curve that you see in here is called the medial axis. And the medial axis of a variety V in Rn is the set of all points U in Rn such that the minimum distance from V to U is attained by two distinct points. Okay, and now if you look closely at this faint blue line, you'll see it actually doesn't, well, if you look very, very closely, I think some of it just, you'll have to believe me, it actually doesn't intersect um, the dark blue curve. Um, and that's actually gonna be true for all uh, smooth curves, um, smooth varieties even. So. One other question we might have is what is the distance from the dark blue curve to this light blue medial axis, um, minimum distance, right? And that is called the reach. So one way to think of the reach, the reach is how far can you walk out from the dark blue curve before you reach some point where you might have one, more than one nearest point. Okay, so um, there's two, Oh, okay, sorry, uh, there we go. Okay, um, and on, in a paper with Emil Horabet, we proved that the reach will be algebraic as an algebraic number. So if V is a smooth algebraic variety in Rn, um, and we'll say we have this variety V defined by these polynomials with rational coefficients, then the reach of V will be an algebraic number over the rationals. Okay. Um, and so, okay, so what this, so this proposition really started my studies. So if something is algebraic, then I want to be able to find a system of polynomials. I want to study it like an algebraic variety. I want to find um, equations, a formula for the degree. So that's sort of how the, this next thing launches off. Um, and it turns out that the reach is the minimum of two quantities. One is related to bottlenecks um, and one is related to curvature. So oh, if we look so, back- so we, we already have a one or two questions, I think, maybe from Matt. So, so you, you define the reach as the infimum. So can, can the medial axis fail to be closed? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, actually. Okay, 
So, okay. Yeah. So what were these? So how is this figure even made? What are all these like blue lines? So these blue lines, um, they actually come from something called Voronoi cells, but approximately they're just normal lines. So they're perpendicular to the variety at a given point. Um, and then where does this like faint blue axis come from? So it comes from, um, sorry, it comes from, so these, where these like blue normal lines run into each other. Um, and you can sort of see that from like across the variety, but it gets a little more confusing sort of down here, like what exactly what's running into each other. So this breaks down into two cases. So one bottlenecks and the other curvature. So a bottleneck is when we have two normal lines from far apart on the variety um, that coincide. So here, uh, so we're at this point Q1 on the variety and there's some normal line and the normal line is in fact normal to the variety in two places. Um, so it coincides with this normal coming from Q2. And then this center point is going to be a point on the medial axis because uh, it's a critical distance from these two points. Um, okay, so that I told you that was for when normals are far away. And then what about when normals are nearby? So Cauchy actually defined curvature um, or the center of curvature. So at every point on a variety, you have a corresponding point called the center of curvature, which is the center of the circle uh, that best approximates the curve. Um, the best second order approximation of the curve is that circle. So, um, right, so that's, and then, so, so, okay, so that's when we have two normals running into each other. And then if, in fact, uh, so there's like a critical condition when three normals, um, this, you know, this is how like Koshi writes about it. So we have the three infinitely close normals intersecting each other, which, you know, we can, we, anyways, we use derivatives, but anyway, so a critical point of curvature um, is this example. So, okay, so I showed you A and C, why is this picture B up here? So B um, contains a circular arc, but we're gonna deal with irreducible varieties of degree greater than three. So we're not gonna have a circular arc. We're just gonna have these far apart normals. And then um, the limiting case where the normals get closer and closer to each other and correspond to some curvature attaining point. Okay, so that's what the, the medial axis is made up of. The candidates for the reach are either these critical curvature points or these bottlenecks. Um, and I studied the bottlenecks with Sandra D. Rocco and David Eklund. So if you denote by B and D the bottleneck degree of V and C N, um, under certain conditions, this will coincide with twice the number of bottleneck pairs. So if we have some, so we have like some plane curve, it has lines on it, um, it has normal lines. You ask how many of those normal lines are in fact normal to the variety in two places. So this is the number of bottleneck pairs. Um, and so we're, we, so we are in the complex numbers, we're not in the real numbers? Yeah, for the degree, yeah, some of yeah, for the degree, we go to the complex numbers. Okay, but the, the original question, which I think of them as being in the complex numbers and you're just drawing real pictures just so we can see them, or was like, was Koshi thinking, who knows what Koshi was thinking? Were they meant to be real pictures or are they meant to symbolize that they're really thinking the complex numbers? I guess I don't, in my, I mean, I, I don't know. It, maybe this is more just like a statement of opinion. In my opinion, what really matters is the real point, but you can only get degree formulas using intersection theory, which re requires complex numbers. Great. So I think the real picture is the real picture. And this is just like the annoying artifact of mathematics. Um, so, okay. So, so for curves in C, okay, so a curve in C2, we get this formula, a curve, a general curve of degree D. Um, I didn't tell you what general means, um, but we get this formula on the order of D to the fourth, a general surface in C3, it's on the order of D to the sixth. Um, and in fact, we show in the paper that we can do this for any smooth variety in any PN in general position, 
Um, and in general, you're going to need more than the degree. Uh, we'll get some formula in terms of the polar classes of the variety. Okay, so this is all sort of motivation telling you how we got to what I, you know, what one of the two focuses for this dog, which is curvature. Okay, so curvature, um, how did we get here? So curvature is central to the study of differential geometry. Okay, so there's like a million papers, books and stuff um, from differential geometers studying the concept of curvature, but it's also a property that can be defined for an algebraic variety. So if you have a point on an algebraic variety, it will have a curvature or some you know, set of curvatures according to different definitions. Um, so my goal here is to build some bridge between differential geometry and computational algebraic geometry. So to take this definition of curvature from differential geometry and put it into my language and my computer's language um, by giving it some defining polynomial equations um, and then also finding the degree of these equations because this tells us how hard these things are to compute. Okay, so that's our goal. Um, it's just, you know, open up differential geometry book, try to understand their definitions by turning them into our language. So I want some system of polynomial equations. Um, and this, you know, this, I don't, so this slide isn't, it's not a new definition. It's a sort of statement of perspective. So an algebraic manifold is an object that we're going to think of as both an algebraic variety and a differentiable manifold. So we have some polynomial with real coefficients. We let V um, be the complex smooth algebraic variety defined by the vanishing of this polynomial. Um, this, this, you, don't, you don't just have to do this for hypersurfaces, but the definition of curvature is like complicated enough with just hypersurfaces. So, uh, okay, so anyway, it's just hypersurface. M is going to be the real part. And this will be a differentiable submanifold of Rn. And then we're going to call M an algebraic manifold. So an algebraic manifold is just a nice place where we can think about both differential geometry and algebraic geometry. OK. So I'm going to spend the next two slides defining curvature. Um, and I promise you like that this, this really is a distillation, OK? So it's, this is a lot of text, but I challenge you to find a faster way to get through this definition. Okay, so we have a manifold M um, and we're gonna let T of M denote the set of smooth vector fields on M, which is the space of smooth sections of the tangent bundle TM. So you take some point on the manifold and assign to it some tangent vector. Um, for every point on the manifold, we have some tangent vector. And then if our manifold is in Rn, we have the Euclidean inner product. So you can, in fact, define normal vectors. So the normal bundle, um, so Nm is denotes the sec space of sec smooth sections of the normal bundle. So we assign a normal vector to every point. Um, okay, and then we have this definition you know, the Euclidean connection. So well, the idea of a connection is um, it gives you a way to differentiate vector fields along other vector fields. So the Euclidean connection on Rn is this map that takes in two vector fields on Rn and spits out a third vector field um, according to this formula. And the way to read this formula is that the new vector field um, the components of it are the directional derivatives of the components of the vector field y in the direction x. Okay, um, but we're back in Rn, so we have a normal component. So the second fundamental form is just when you take the normal part um, of the second, uh, sorry, of the Euclidean connection. Okay. So, so to me, I've now long, I realize I've maybe, I do remember hearing the phrase some second fundamental form in some previous life, but now I have no recollection as to what, should I, what the hell is that? Like, what, what, what is, you're taking two vectors and you're getting some normal, what, what, should I, 
maybe I should just not even ask this question or embarrass myself. But uh, should I just say this is this is a thing and it's obviously important uh, and I should just ignore it. Or, or can you tell me why what what it is? Maybe you should just tell me to maybe you need on my question. Let's go ahead and make an algebraic geometry for me. Okay, yeah, I guess, yeah, if you're like, well, you'd rather see it in the terms of polynomial equations, I guess me too. Um, so I, I think a few slides from now, uh, I'm gonna turn this all into polynomial equations. So um, yeah, if that, if that helps you understand it. Uh, or another thing I could do is tell you why I want the second fundamental form, like what it's used for, um, or show you an example for two by two matrices. So if M is a surface in R3, then we're gonna pick some point and some special vector fields, uh, X and Y, such that X of P and Y of P form an orthonormal basis of the tangent space. And then we're also gonna pick a unit vector. Um, here we have a surface in R3. So the unit vector is, there's just one unit vector up to, or sorry, just one unit normal vector up to sign. Um, and the principal curvatures of M at P are gonna be the eigenvalues of, uh, of this symmetric matrix. So here's where we use the second fundamental form um, and our normal vector. And if we furthermore choose X and Y so that the matrix is diagonal, then X and P and Y and P are the called the principal directions um, up to a choice of normal vector. So to recap what we have, so at every point on my surface, um, there's a curvature defined in every direction, but so in every direction, but okay, but one of those directions at so at so one of those directions will be the maximum curvature at P, and one of them will be the minimum curvature at P. Um, and those two will be orthogonal to each other, and they're called the principal directions. So those are the two, those two vectors are the principal directions, and then their scalar magnitude, uh, you know, up to sign is the principal or the principal curvatures at that point. Okay, so here let's see it on some actual surfaces, some quadric surfaces in R3. Um, so, or okay, actually, so, you know, if I see it, I mean, so, okay, so we have, so every point we have these two principal curvatures and there are a couple things that are interesting that can happen. So one is that uh, the principal curvatures could be critical um, or at, at some point there could be one curvature that is like, it's locally critical. Um, so it's like a local minimum or maximum if you uh, differentiate along some curve from that point. So those points we call critical curvature points and they are these points in green. Um, another cool thing that can happen is the two principal curvatures can be equal. So what I'm telling you here is that the maximum and minimum curvature are equal, but that just means the curvature is going to be the same in every direction. Um, and well, what does that sound like? Well, that sounds like a sphere. So at these red points called umbilical points or umbilics, the best second order approximation of the surface is a sphere. Um, in one sense, like I think these are interested in their, interesting in their own right. And then they're also, we started most interested in the critical curvature points, but it was important to exclude the umbilics uh, in our analysis of critical curvature points. Um, but anyways, we end up with these green points and these red points. Uh, let me first talk more about the green points and then I'll talk about the red points. Okay, so this is a theorem about the green points. So I studied the green points um, with Maddie Brandt uh, for plane curves. So if V in the real plane R2 is a smooth irreducible curve of degree greater than or equal to three, then the degree of critical curvature, so this is roughly the number of points um, of critical curvature on the curve. So where the, cur the it's maximally curvy or minimally curvy, 
will be 6d squared minus 10d. Um, yeah, we actually proved this. Our proof was inspired by some work of George Salmon, who was a 19th century mathematician. Um, so, you know, I, it was really quaint and fun to study that book, but it didn't generalize well to higher dimensions. So that sort of led to a separate project. Like, can we get this degree formula for something other than plain curves? Um, and the first step is just to get a system of polynomial equations. Uh, so let's try to get a system of polynomial equations um, where the solutions of the equations are points, are critical curvature points. Okay, so, uh, okay, so first ignore the second paragraph. So the following equations will define the locus of pairs X and U where X is a point in our manifold and U is a principal direction at X. So every point X is gonna have two of these, um, except for umbilics, but whatever. Every point is gonna have almost, or yeah, any, anyways. So every point is gonna have- So two, two here is, is N minus one or something. Oh, oh uh, yes. I like to think in surfaces, even if this particular set of equations would work in, right. for hypersurface in general. Um, yes, so, okay. Okay, so let me just go through what these equations mean. Um, so, yeah, and I think this is sort of, you know, in the fifth equation, we kind of will, or which is actually a set of equations, whatever, we get to the point, um, maybe this will help Ravi, who wasn't happy with the definition of second fundamental form. Here, we're gonna put it into polynomial equations for him. So, okay, so this first equation just says that X is a point on our manifold. So the manifold is defined by this equation F. The second equation um, says that U is a, uh, a normal vector. Um, okay, so, because the principal directions are normal vectors. Third equation says that we want them to be unit normal vectors because curvature is defined with respect to this unit normal bundle. Um, the fourth equation gets a little complicated. So basically the problem, so we're, we're trying to get this unit normal bundle, but the gradient at every point is gonna be a different length. So we introduce this variable lambda um, to help us deal with that fact. <laughs> um, yeah, it's just, I don't know, it's just sort of a necessary evil is we will end up in a product of these things with this extra variable lambda. Um, the washing machine just decided to announce its presence. There's no clothes in there, whatever. So um, cool. So anyways, what does this last equation say? So I want you to ignore the third term of that equation um, and just look at these first two terms. So H of S of F is the Hessian matrix for um, the equation F. So it's the matrix of second order partial derivatives. And if you just look at these first two terms, then what this says is that U is an eigenvector of the Hessian. Okay. So, so wait, the Hessian but we have a so the, third. The Hessian's a square matrix, right? Yes, the Hessian is a square matrix. And U is a is a vector. So this is like a yeah. vector. Okay. And then Y1 is yeah, a yeah. So U is a vector. Y1 is a, a new variable we've never seen before. Yes. Right. And then Y and then oh, great. Okay, good. So this is like a vector equals this is the zero vector. Got it. Just making sure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is this is N equations. Um yeah. Yeah, this is a vector equation. Okay, so yeah, what, that's what this dot means. It's matrix multiplication. Um, and okay, so okay, so we I told you it was an eigenvector, but that's not quite true. Uh, this third term just says, and we might have something else in the normal space. So U is an eigenvector of the Hessian when we restrict to the tangent space. Okay. So given, you know, now that we've set up, now that we have our X and our U and our Lambda and our Y1 and our Y2 that satisfy these equations, um, we can define the 
where we can give the value of the curvature. So the curvature will be given by the absolute value of this function g of x u lambda. Um, okay. So now we're all set up to find our critical curvature points uh, just by the principle of Lagrange multipliers, right? We have this maximization or optimization problem. We're optimizing the function g with the constraints of these n plus four equations. Um, so, uh, so the principle of Lagrange multipliers is that critical points happen in normal spaces. So we're going to intersect this locus um, with the locus defined by the vanishing of the minors of a matrix of partial derivatives of the above equations and partial derivatives of the objective function. Okay, so this is here. I now my computer um, can understand my differential geometry textbook. Uh, so my computer can understand it and intersection theory can understand it too. So uh, with Paul Brighting and Christian Ronestad, we found an upper bound for the critical curvature degree. Um, so here, so I remember a couple slides ago, Maddie Brandt and I had one for plane curves. Uh, now we're gonna present one for surfaces in R3. Um, and our methods actually do generalize to uh, hypersurfaces in any dimension, but we're gonna state the formula for R3. So if V in R3 is a smooth irreducible surface of degree greater than or equal to three, then there'll be only finitely many complex critical curvature points. Um, and an upper bound for their number is given by this expression in D cubed. Uh, how did we get this formula? Well, I showed you the equations. Um, the equations plus Porteous's formula from intersection theory plus Bezu. Uh, so anyway, so this is why we have this upper bound and we can see, well, how bad of an upper bound is it? Pretty bad. So this table um, shows you for every D, so for every degree, what does our upper bound give? And then what's the actual number? So, so, what, so what's, what's the, is the meaning of this that the thing on the left is you want to find the number of complex solutions of this. And the thing on the right is you have this question of the real numbers and not all the solutions will be real that you know for sure. And so or what is what is the meaning of upper bound in this sentence? Yeah, so it, yeah, it's, it's worse than that. It's not just like a real versus complex thing. So, okay, so this number on the right for D equals two was computed sort of by hand with quadrics. You can actually just like work through all these equations. Um, and then for three and four, it was computed uh, numerically. So this is like a certified number of solutions. There could be more, um, but yeah. So why are these numbers so different? So a couple of things happen. One, I mean, I think you guys will sort of see. So this, the slide of her equations, like this was, this was a very difficult part of this project. Um, you see how we have all these like things like Lambda Y1, Y2, and all these things are sort of defined in real space, but we need to projectify and when we projectivize the equations, we ended up adding some false solutions. Um, yeah, so you just you get you get more than you bargained for. So we know that our locus is a subset of this, but it's a subset plus some extra stuff. And then, and then I get kind of scared because uh, when you add extra stuff, sometimes you get higher dimensional extra stuff. And then when you compute some topological number, you get a number. But some of the stuff you added might have been negative, and so you may have like added. So, so you actually have to do some. So you, so you just you turned into some problem which included your answer, and you got the like you you turned it into some broad intersection theory problem which included the thing to finally get. You might have had some crap you don't want off at infinity, and you computed it after that in the left, and then on the right you had examples that would certify numbers of solutions. Is that, is that, am I getting that roughly right or? Uh... So, I mean, we're able to understand the extra solutions a little bit and to make sure that, um, that we don't have like a whole extra dimension of solutions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is this upper bound. Um, and where does this lead us next? Okay, so back here we had red points and green points. 
And I've just talked to you about, you know, the state of the art for green points. That's as far as we got for green points. Um, but red I mean, points green, are also- The green were the sphere-like ones, do I have that right? Or no, one? green was critical points. Okay, the red, um, the red were the umbilical spherical, the sphere-like ones. Yes. So now we shift to these umbilical sphere-like points. Um, and what can we say about those? Well, our old friend, George Salmon, uh, studied this question in R3, um, and he came up for, with a formula for the degree of the variety of umbilics of a general surface of degree D. Um, his proof is, you know, the peak of 19th century mathematics, but uh, we, you know, I don't know, modern, modern day we have different expectations for proofs. I'm sure 100 years from now they're also going to be like, can you believe they said that? But we're trying to bring this proof into 2021. So in the upcoming archive post, you'll see a modernization of this proof um, using, you know, the algebraic, algebraic geometry techniques we have available to us now. Um, I, I'm just curious. Did you did you have to like read these papers from the 19th century? Like, where, was it written in old English? I, I don't like. What was that like? Yeah, I, I so I think it was actually a pleasant experience. So Salmon has a number of treatises. Um, they are, you know, they're sort of like photographed online. You can get these All right. copies. Of them. And he, it, he writes it in a way, like, I, I don't know. I think that this could actually be a good thing for like RU students or something, because most of it's, you know, understandable to a high school student, but of course, yeah, there's, you know, there's actual ideas and then, you know, reproving his stuff right. is opens up a fun problem. Cool. Okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm a George Salmon fan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, so, right. Okay, so I told you the talk was a little bit autobiographical. Um, so we have these red points and Salmon got this formula for plane or for surfaces. Um, and we reproved his formula for surfaces, but I wanted to know more about like higher dimensions. And so I set out Googling this and an umbilic is a point where the second fundamental form has repeated eigenvalues, right? So the two principal curvatures are equal. Um, and, and, you know, and this is a part, part of a larger class. So for any matrix, you could partition the eigenvalue multiplicities in any number of ways. Um, and this is an algebraic variety. You can, you know, you can come up with polynomial equations that state these conditions. Um, so what I wanted to know is what is known about the algebraic geometry of matrices with repeated eigenvalues. Uh, so it turns out the answer is, answer is like not very much at all, right? So this is studied by linear algebraists, um, but I wanted to, I think of everything as an algebraic variety. So I wanted to know like what's the dimension, degree, defining polynomial equations and all that. Um, so that is the remainder of the talk is uh, matrices with repeated eigenvalues, if we think of them as an algebraic variety, what properties can we understand? Okay, so let me define the variety of questions or the, you know, class of varieties. So we're going to let lambda be a partition of n, um, and what's for ambient space? For ambient space is R to the n plus one choose two, which is the space of real symmetric n by n matrices. And then the variety of lambda partitioned eigenvalues um, in this space is the Zariski closure of the locus of matrices with eigenvalue multiplicities determined by lambda. Um, so when you take the Zariski closure, you also get some matrices whose eigenvalues are determined by a partition coarser than lambda. Um, but, you know, this is just like some set of matrices. One question that you might have is why real symmetric matrices? Um, so my next slide is to attempt to convince. I, 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 there I can, under, I can believe real symmetric, and, but here real versus complex, there is now going to be, because real symmetric is so, is so important, now there's going to be a really big difference between real and complex. So I'm curious what's going to happen next as to what, what you will what we, what we do. Okay, yeah. So here is in this next slide, I will I will explain to people why, you know, why are real symmetric. 
So there's sort of four combinations I can think of here, real symmetric, real square, complex symmetric, complex square, but you'll notice real square actually doesn't end up making it to the table. And that's because real square matrices can have um, non-real eigenvalues, which I don't know, I don't like that. But real symmetric matrices have all real eigenvalues. Um, okay, so, now, uh, let me recall a little bit of linear algebra. So something called the Jordan normal form, um, AKA Jordan canonical form um, and corresponding to every matrix, there is something called the Jordan normal form, which is gonna be an upper triangular matrix, the uh, diagonal, the, the eigenvalues are on the diagonal, and then the only other non-zero entries in the matrix are that you can have some ones um, in the, it's called the super diagonal. So like the diagonal right above the main diagonal. Um, and this, this happens when the geometric and algebraic multiplicity of the eigenvalues differ. Um, so for complex square complex matrix and real symmetric matrices, we all have this Jordan normal form. Um, by which I mean, so for real square matrices, we can't do this because the eigenvalues can be non-complex and you just kind of want it defined over the same field that the matrices are defined over. So, um, okay. So let's examine the locus of Jordan normal of matrices with a given Jordan normal form in each type. So for all three settings, you'll have one dimension full of, um, Okay, right, right. So here we're in the case of two by two matrices where there's one repeated eigenvalue. So these are the two Jordan normal forms available to us. Um, and this one will, there's like one dimensions worth. And then let's look at this second Jordan normal form. So these are the matrices that aren't diagonalizable. And for complex square, you have a dimension three space worth of these. For complex symmetrics, you have a dimension two space of these, um, but real symmetric, you have none. So this is like a fancy way of saying, so real symmetric matrices are diagonalizable by, um, by orthogonal matrices. Um, and this will become like a theme for the next slides is how can we use this property? Because this property really says that we can study certain properties of these real symmetric matrices through their diagonalizations. Okay. Uh, so yeah, so, you know, when you're trying to learn about an algebraic variety, you ask, you know, like where it's from, what are your hobbies? What are your, what's your dimension? So, uh, here is this formula for the dimension. So for dimension, yeah, I think Robbie was like, well, real complex, what are you going to do? So dimension is defined for complex varieties. So the complex that so we have the dimension for the complexification. So the complexification V C sub lambda of the real algebraic variety V R V sub R of lambda of real n by n symmetric matrices with eigenvalue multiplicities corresponding to the partition lambda um, with m parts of n or partitions coarser than lambda is going to be an irreducible variety of dimension m so number of parts plus n choose two minus um, the sum of lambda i choose two. It is what it is. It's the dimension. Uh, we proved it in part using the parameterization on this next slide. Okay, so what's the idea here? So there's two ways to present a variety, at least you know, two ways you can present um, explicit or you know implicit equations. You can say it's defined, it's the set of solutions to the system of polynomial equations or you can prevent, present it explicitly, which is you say, you, like, this is how you generate the points. Okay, and the, the this is how you generate the points can be useful for numerical stuff. So that's what I do here. Um, so let lambda be a partition of N uh, such that lambda is not the all ones vector. So what I'm doing here is I'm requiring that lambda have or that the matrix have a repeated eigenvalue. The reason that I do this is that real symmetric matrices are diagonalizable by orthogonal matrices, but um, 
if you if you add a repeated eigenvalue, then it actually suffices to use special orthogonal matrices, um, which I prefer because the, the, the place that this parameterization comes from is that, so, okay, so the way to, you know, to read this parameterization is that we, we write every matrix, you know, in it's like sort of diagonalization form. Um, and uh, so we have, you know, the, the diagonal matrix of eigenvalues, and then on the left and right, we are conjugating by um, a special orthogonal matrix. And it turns out that there's a handy uh, parameterization of special orthogonal matrices by skew symmetric matrices. So, um, so D. So, so, so this looks like something that one should, or, you know, I should recognize, but I don't recognize it at all. Like using our special orthogonal matrices can be naturally understood as I plus B over I minus B where B is skew symmetric. That's kind of, okay, I don't know, that's all. Okay. Yeah. If you were an engineer, maybe you'd be more likely to recognize it. <laughs> I don't know. Is it a super standard? It looks like it's gotta be super standard. I've never seen it before. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I guess, but you know, standard to whatever population is interested in such things. Um, which is me at the moment. Okay. So anyways, so we have this parameterization of the Zariski open dense subset um, by rational functions. Uh, in my opinion, everything should be given in terms of rational functions. Okay, so what do we do? So one thing we did with this proposition, this parameterization, is we got the dimension formula. Another thing that we do is that we generate points. So, okay, so a, you know, a question that you might have about a variety is one, it's implicit structure as well, right? You just sort of want this system of polynomial equations like I gave you for the critical curvature points um, for our variety VR lambda. And you know, and this proved to be a sort of challenging task, but for small n, we used the parameterization to generate points on the variety um, and then used interpolation to find polynomials that vanish on this point, on these points. So here is an example. These are four by four matrices with two eigenvalues of multiplicity two. And we find with interpolation these nine quadrics that vanish on our set of points. And then we ask, well, is this enough equations? Um, and here's where Macaulay two comes in. So Macaulay two and our dimension formula say, so Macaulay two says we have a prime, sorry, we have a, prime ideal um, of this dimension, which is the correct dimension according to our formula. Um, Macaulay 2 also gives us the degree. Uh, and yeah, so anyways, here is an example of how for small n, we can use these methods to get equations um, and then you know use Macaulay 2 to get a degree. So, so your game here is, okay, so you, you have you have something, you have a variety, you want, you want to find its actual idea, you want actual generators. And you're going to find it by randomly taking some points and then using that to find some things and seeing whether you're done by tossing in the call and seeing whether you cut out the right thing. That's, that's the game. Okay. Yes. But, and would you mind actually just going back one page just so I can see that thing? Okay. Great, thanks. Okay, so we've done this for small n. Unfortunately, so interpolation is nice for small n. Um, for larger n, you just sort of get these matrices whose dimensions are kind of out of control. Uh, but we do have some representation theory on our side that allows us to split up these matrices into smaller um, matrices. So the idea here is that the ideal a polynomial is vanishing on our variety is stable under the action by conjugation of the real orthogonal group because conjugating doesn't change um, doesn't change the eigenvalues. So, uh, so what this means is that the degree d homogeneous component um, of this ideal is a representation of ON. Um, I'm not an expert in the representation theory of ON, but it is a reductive group 
um, and you can split things into irreducible representations. So this gives a method that you know I didn't implement, but this is a possible pathway towards finding equations for these varieties um, when n is larger and interpolation just isn't going to work. So in this case, you're saying just find one equation, hit it with the group, and maybe you got everything. Or if you just want a representation, is that what you're? Is that what you may be saying here? Um, I'm sort of saying that you can you can split things up into the irreducible representations. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if you knew the irreducible representation is turning up, then all you have to do is basically find one, you know, find one random equation probably of each one of the and then okay, I think I'm happy with that. Okay, great. Okay. Okay. So yeah, so you know, in general you can write chapters of books if about the representations of on um or in our case you can just study the one dimensional ones so uh so here um so if you know a few things come together on this side one you maybe recall like several slides ago i was like oh one reason we like real symmetric matrices is that their diagonalizations are, you can study them through their diagonalizations because they're diagonalizable. So here we're gonna bring together a few ideas. So denote by uh, I of this variety to the ON, the graded vector space of ON invariant polynomials in this ideal, and then let VR D lambda to note the intersection of our variety with the variety of diagonal matrices. We're just taking the diagonal matrices um, with diagonal entries or eigenvalues according to some partition. Um, so we now, you know, we have two varieties here. We have our whole variety. We have just the diagonal one. Our whole variety is acted on by the orthogonal group. Our diagonal one, well, this is just a list of n numbers, is acted on by the symmetric group, which you know lives inside the orthogonal group as permutation matrices. Um, and then this this weird notation with like the upper SN means the graded vector space of SN invariant polynomials. And what we found was that these vector spaces, so the whole space under ON and the just the diagonal space under SN are isomorphic as graded vector spaces, um, which is convenient for us because this, you know, the D lambda and SN, this is fairly well understood. Um, right, this is just like some subset of symmetric polynomials. And then what is this, what does this, so this seems like this could be really, this kind of thing could be useful in lots of situations where you have a group action, you can turn something from something to a vial group, or if I link ON into some, or, and, uh, and so there's about all the complexity of this weird thing on the left turns into something simpler on the right because you understand something of thinking of SN. But in this case, what is it by, like, what is it, the fact that they're the same graded vector space, like what's, what is that by you now? What is that, what can you do with that? I like well, I mean, I, I can, I, it makes it a lot easier to find those like, the equations on the left. Oh, so you mean not just the R isomorphic, you even know the isomorphism. Uh, I take that back. Okay, <laughs> so I don't, I guess, yeah, I know. I haven't actually worked through the- Right. Okay, great, uh, yeah, great. Okay. I can ponder more and have a more, more concrete question, so. Yes, okay. Um, okay, so, okay, so back to, so what, what do we get from this diagonal variety? Um, well, you know, one of our goals at the beginning was to find the degree of the variety, and we didn't get a formula for the degree in general. We can get it for some small n um, by, you know, by finding the actual equations, putting it into Macaulay 2. And then we can also get it for the diagonal restriction. So the degree of the diagonal restriction uh, will be n factorial over um, product of lambda i factorial. Um, and then, okay, here, just one other thing. So, so one of my interests is distance optimization and in distance optimization, there's this concept called the Euclidean distance degree. So the idea is that if I have, I have some point in RN and some variety, and I might want to know like, what's my nearest point. Um, 
But you know, there's some questions that are easier to ask than other questions. So that's kind of a hard question to ask, but you could ask uh, how many nearest points do I have, but you actually, you, know, you can't ask how many nearest points I can have. The Zariski closure of the question is how many critical points are there of the distance function to the variety? Um, and this turns out you just, you know, give it a couple conditions, complexify, take the smooth locus, and then this will be constant um, in general. So this number for a variety is called its Euclidean distance degree. Um, and people who do distance optimization care about this. This sort of says, how hard is this problem to do distance optimization with? Uh, so Bick and Dryisma proved um, that sort of that you can reduce things to the diagonalization. So we have this formula for the degree of the whole variety, but we can also get the formula for the Euclidean distance degree of, sorry, the formula for the degree of the diagonal variety, and we, then we can get the Euclidean distance degree of the whole variety. Um, and they're actually the same. Uh, so what this tells us is that in terms of distance optimization, um, the diagonal restriction is actually a pretty good model for the variety. Okay. Uh, so what would we we'd be interested in for future work? So one thing is, you know, I showed you the upper bound for critical curvature, which is exciting. Just, you know, it says like we have a handle on this, um, but, it, but it was a pretty large difference. So we could obtain an exact formula or a tighter bound would be something interesting to do. Um, or something else is sort of, you know, a theme of this talk has been, we'll take objects from differential geometry, linear algebra, distance optimization, and formulate them as systems of polynomial equations and study their real algebraic geometry. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So I guess we can unmute ourselves and thank Maddie for letting you talk.